Here we're going to dive into the post-quantum crypto algorithms covered in that Wikipedia article. If you haven't seen the intro video, you can start there. There's not too much to it, so let me dive in right here. It's really technical articles and technical information like this that inspired me to create these read-along videos in the first place. So first of all, there are currently six different approaches to post-quantum cryptography. So they call it approaches. I'm thinking they just mean to say algorithms. But my question, how many approaches will this Wikipedia article cover to post-quantum cryptography research? According to them, the research is focused on these six. But I'm just going to say the Wikipedia article is just focused on these six. Keep your mind open to other approaches slash algorithms. Right, so the first one is lattice-based. This approach includes cryptographic systems such as learning with errors, ring learning with errors, known as ring LWE, the ring learning with errors key exchange, and the ring learning with errors signature. So real basic question, what is this ring learning they're referring to? Now some other systems is the older NTRU or GGH encryption schemes. So this is an open source public key system. I love open source. GGH stands for Goldrick Goldweiser Halavi. Must be the name of the creators of this system. And the newer NTR signature and Bliss signatures. Some of these schemes, like NTRU encryption, have been studied for many years without anyone finding a feasible attack. Others, like the Ring LWE algorithms, have proofs that their security or reduces to a worst case problem. The post-quantum cryptography study group sponsored by the European Commission suggested that the Stellistenfield variant of NTRU be studied for standardization rather than the NTRU algorithm. So a rough question, but something to help us um, maybe remember information. Uh, what should we study rather than the NTRU algorithm? Apparently we should be studying the this, however you say it, variant. And there's not a link, a hyperlink here for us to click on, so not sure about future readings on that. Step one though is for us to use it as the answer to this question. To finish off this section, at that time, NTRU was still patented. Studies have indicated that the NTRU may have more secure properties than other lattice-based algorithms. So that sucks. A proprietary, proprietary algorithm has more secure properties. How are we supposed to learn if we can't open source things like that to study it? Moving on though, there's a multivariant cryptography. This includes cryptographic systems such as the rainbow, unbalanced oil and vinegar scheme, which is based on the difficulty of solving systems of multivariant equations. Various attempts to build secure multivariant equation encryption schemes have failed. However, multivariant signature schemes like Rainbow could provide the basis for a quantum secure digital si uh, signature. All right, I read too much. I should have paused right here for a question. I'm simply going to ask, what is a multivariate equation? There is a stack exchange cryptography uh, message board that we can eventually go to. So I'll have to leave that question unanswered for now. I could ask this follow-up question though. What is an example of a multivariate signature scheme? And the answer is Rainbow. Rainbow is the name of a multivariate signature scheme. One in which could be providing us with secure digital signatures. Okay, moving on to hash-based cryptography. This includes cryptographic systems such as Lamport signatures and the Merkle signature scheme and the newer XMSS. I have an RFC reading on that XMSS. And then there's something called a Sphinx scheme. The citation takes us to some lecture notes. But hash-based digital signatures were invented in the late 1970s by Ralph Merkel and have been studied ever since as an interesting alternative to number theoretic digital signatures like RSA and DSA. So I'm thinking this is a good question. What is an alternative to hash algorithms? And the answer is actually either number theoretic digital signatures or you could just simply say RSA and DSA. But to break apart why they call those encryption algorithms number theoretic digital signatures, I do not know. What does number theoretic mean? If I took a guess, made a prediction for the sake of learning, um, I wonder if it has anything to do with randomness. 
Now their primary drawback is that for any hash-based public key, there is a limit on the number of signatures that can be signed using the corresponding set of private keys. This fact had reduced interest in these signatures until interest was revived due to the desire for cryptography that was resistant to attack by quantum computers. And there appear to be no patents on the Merkle signature scheme, and there exists many non-patented hash functions that could be used with these schemes. And I wonder if the RFC itself can provide a um, citation for that fact, that there seem to be no patents. Just the fact that Wikipedia says something like that, though, is kind of unprofessional, and we should edit it. At the very least, just omit it. But it is interesting that they follow up by saying that there exists many non-patented hash functions that could be used with these schemes. The stateful hash base signature scheme, XMSS, is described in RFC 8391, and note that all the above schemes are one-time or bounded time signatures. And you guys should note that this is an experimental, or is in an experimental phase. But if you're watching this video, you're probably in the beginning of your uh, cryptography studies anyways. We're not at the level where Moni Nayor or Moti Young um, is at. They invented a UOWHF, which is a universal one-way hash function. This type of hashing in 1989 uh, was designed as a signature based on hashing called the Nayor Young scheme which can be unlimited time in use. What does unlimited time mean? Whatever it means, whatever this is, it does not require trapdoor properties. And hey, at least we're getting to know that this term signature simply means the output of something, such as the output of a hash algorithm. Okay, let's go into code-based cryptography. This includes cryptographic systems which rely on error-correcting codes, such as the MCLIS and Neoderator encryption algorithms, and the related Courtois, Venice. Okay, I just give up on these names. I don't want to insult anybody by messing them up so badly. But the original Michaelis signature using random GOPA codes has withstood scrutiny for over 30 years. However, many variants of the Michaelis scheme, which seek to introduce more structure into the code used in order to reduce the size of the keys, have been shown to be insecure. So how about this for a question? What type of codes are used in the Michaelis signature? Apparently random GOPA codes. A binary GOPA code in mathematics and computer science is an error correcting code that belongs to the class of general GOPA codes originally described by a person named GOPA, but the binary structure gives it severe several mathematical advantages over non-binary variants, also providing a better fit for common usage in computers and telecommunications. So there's some complex math stuff for you to look at. I'm going to just scroll through and look for any examples of uh, binary numbers. Okay, didn't find it. Let's get back to our main topic, though. According to this sentence, so many variants of the Michaelis scheme are insecure. So let's make an inference here. My question says, why are variants of this Michaelis scheme insecure? And we can infer that it's insecure because these variants not just seek to introduce more structure. I don't think that's so related to the security problem. I assume its attempt to reduce the size of keys is the reason it's insecure. So moving on, the post-quantum cryptography study group sponsored by the European Commission has recommended the Michaelis public key encryption system as a candidate for long-term protection against attacks by computers. Quantum computers. Okay, long-winded question here, but what does the cryptography study group, which is sponsored by the European Commission, suggest as a candidate for public key encryption system? All right, I'm going to simplify the question a little bit. What do they suggest we use for an encryption system? And they suggest we use the Michaelis public key system. Almost done here, we have two more sections. This is the super singular elliptic key isogeny cryptography section. This system relies on the properties of super singular elliptic curves and super singular isogeny graphs to create a Diffie-Hellman replacement with forward secrecy. So apparently isogeny is a thing in mathematics. It's a morphism of algebraic groups that is surjective and has a finite kernel if the groups are 
abelian variants than any morphism, such as um, A to B. I assume F is uh, for function. So any morphism of the underlying algebraic varieties, which is surjective with finite fibers, is automatically an isogeny. That tells me nothing. Way over my head here. Let's jump to Google Images. Okay, these pictures kind of help out a little bit because I see chaos. So if we're looking at encryption, and we're trying to take something and make it look very chaotic. What would we say? We use isogeny? Maybe that sentence makes sense. We use isogeny. We use a morphism of groups. It's cool to see a mathematics thing say the word kernel, like a operating system kernel. Oh boy, I found a mathematics um, stack exchange answer to this question. I don't want to get off on this topic though. I'll leave this up and read it later. But let's move on. This so-called super singular elliptic curve isogeny, this system uses the well-studied mathematics, okay, of the thing I just said, to create a Diffie-Hellman-like key exchange that can serve as a straightforward quantum computing resistant replacement for the Diffie-Hellman and the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Okay, let's stop right there, um, but I'm definitely feeling better about everything. What is a super singular elliptic curve similar to? The answer is a Diffie-Hellman key exchange. It's a nice simple answer, nice simple question to make us feel more comfortable with these crazy big terms. And yes, they're in widespread use today. That's probably why I already knew a little bit about them. Now, because it works much like the existing Diffie-Hellman implementations, it offers forward secrecy. If I could summarize what that means for you guys real quick, all that says is for each thing that you're encrypting, it's going to have a different key. And thus, if somebody breaks the first one, um, there is forward secrecy because then they would have to break the next one and the one after that. And they're saying right here actually why. To prevent mass surveillance by governments, but also to protect against the compromise of long-term keys through failures. I think we should maybe omit this part because governments aren't the only entity we should be, be worried about preventing in terms of mass surveillance. I would argue corporations are right there too, but let's stay on topic. In um, 2012, researchers Sun Tian Anwang for the Chinese State Key Lab for Integrated Service Networks and Zidian University extended the work of Dei Feo, Zhao, and Plut to create quantum secure digital signatures based on the super singular elliptic curve isogenies. There are no patents covering this cryptographic system. Thank goodness, because I could barely understand isogeny already. Okay, our last one, and we need one more question to make 13. It says, symmetric key quantum resistance. Provided one uses sufficiently large key sizes, the symmetric key cryptographic systems like AES and SNOW 3G are already resistant to attack by a quantum computer. Further, key management systems and protocols that use symmetric key cryptography instead of public key cryptography like Kerberos and the 3GPP mobile network authentication structure are also inherently secure against attack by a quantum computer. Given its widespread deployment in the world already, some researchers recommend expanded use of Kerberos-like symmetric key management as an efficient way to get post-cryptography today. Post-quantum cryptography, sorry. So we end the way we began, where I said, all you have to do is make sure your key sizes are large enough and we'll be fine with most of the things we're already using. So let's make our final question like a really deep one where you can write as much or as little as you'd like. So do we have anything to fear when it comes to quantum computers breaking our encryption? You could go either way with your answer, but if you write a lot and support your opinion with technical details, you'll be doing some really good learning.